Call this regularly scheduled meeting of Bridgewater Town Council to yeah. order. Uh, welcome everybody. For those viewing us online, our, our giant audience, we have uh, some people here in person, socially distanced, which is great to see. And again, just thrilled to be able to meet in person. And again, those watching online will notice we're not sitting in our usual seats because we are all uh, maintaining that uh, six foot distance. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Hearing none, we will deem the uh, agenda approved and move right into presentations of an achievement award. And I'll turn it over to Deputy Mayor Tanner to uh, sounds great. To read the uh, is is uh, Joseph Vogel in the audience? There you are. Come on down, Joseph. 
Joseph lives in Bridgewater and is an employee at the ARC. He has been involved in Special Olympics for 30 plus years. He currently competes in bocce and bowling. Joseph received a gold medal in bowling at the Nova Scotia Special Olympics Provincial Winter Games in February 2019 at Camp Aldershot. The bowling competition took place at CFB Greenwood. This qualified him for a chance to represent the province at the upcoming national competition. Joseph was officially selected to Team Nova Scotia to go to the 2020 Special Olympics National Winter Games in Thunder Bay, Ontario from February 25th to 29th to compete in five pin bowling. Joseph's training coaches include his weekly coach, Louise Corgum and John McIntosh, who was his training coach for the National Games. Joseph trained at Greenwood uh, as it has a five pin bowling alley. Joseph placed seventh in his division at these Canada Winter Games. So we're giving him two medallions tonight. The mayor's already done that. Uh, 2019 Special Olympics Nova Scotia Provincial Winter Games Bowling Champion and a 2020 Special Olympics Team Nova Scotia member National Winter Games Bowling. Congratulations. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Lots to be proud of there. Absolutely. Uh, are there any <coughs> announcements from any members of council? We're still kind of light on some things. Always look at Councilor Thorburn to see what's coming up. Uh, we get a meeting uh, Wednesday with the museum, so next we'll have a report. Perfect, wonderful. Um, there are two proclamations. One is Right to Know Week, which is September 28th to October 4th, and then uh, Medic Monday is September 28th, and those will be posted on our social media feeds and on, online. Uh, I also want to uh, kind of point out this coin. This is a challenge coin. Uh, it's kind of neat. It's from the Kinsmen. This was Kinsmen's, or this past year was their 100th anniversary. And those who remember Brian Cooper, who uh, has been a great number of years in our community, was the president of Kinsman Canada for their 100th year. So he just finished that, um, but uh, uh, proud of him for that achievement. And then so he, uh, he passed on this challenge coin. So our congratulations to him. He just finished that through the challenge of, uh, challenge coin would be good during COVID because it was a challenge, but uh, okay, we're, we're kind of, proud of him for this thing so we'll put that uh, in town hall somewhere we have no delegations that have registered uh, minutes of August 10th 2020 regular town council meeting are there any errors omissions deletions hearing none we will deem the minutes as approved and go down to right down to planning items and conveyance of a public street which is uh, a portion of roundhouse drive and I see that uh, our development officer, Mr. Brown, is here, and he'll walk us through that. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, Ziegler Homes Limited has advised staff that they wish to convey a portion of Roundhouse Drive to the town and have requested that Council accept the deed and declare this extension of Roundhouse Drive a public street. This would allow the developer to subdivide and build homes where the street and services are under construction, or while they're under construction. Um, it would also allow completion of three homes on Gow Drive, which currently lack services. In accordance with the subdivision bylaw, uh, a subdivider or developer may request declaration of a public street either upon full completion, or in this case, the developer is requesting takeover of the street prior to completion of the street and services. To entertain such a request, a performance surety or bond must be submitted in the amount of 125% of the estimated cost of completion of that street or the, that work. Uh, together with the surety, staff have drafted a servicing agreement to outline terms and conditions associated with the early takeover, including the provision to complete the streets and services by September 31st, 2021, and options for the town should that not happen. Staff are satisfied with the surety amount and the agreement, therefore, Staff recommend that Council accept the deed for the proposed public street and declare by motion the acceptance of said public street, portion of Roundhouse Drive, conditional on receipt of the performance surety and execution of the servicing agreement. Questions from Council? It's pretty straightforward. Someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Thorburn? I will your motion. I move that Council accept the deed for the proposed public street and accept as public street conditional on receipt of a permit surety and execution of the servicing agreement. 
Seconded by Deputy <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Tanner. <laughs> Have we worried there for a while? Further discussion? Question. Questions be called. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, next item 7.2 is the land use bylaw and uh, municipal planning strategy amendment for special commercial zone. And Mr. Brown again. Thank Busy you. day for you today. <laughs> yes. All right. So the special commercial zone was created in 1988 to allow pre existing commercial land uses to continue in existing buildings where the surround, surrounding land uses were and, and still are predominantly residential. In the 1997 land use bylaw, the special commercial zone was more flexible in that offices and personal service shops were permitted as of right and a variety of commercial uses were permitted by development agreement. Permissions were scaled back in 2014 and currently the zone permits single and two unit dwellings along with the identified commercial use uh, that is permitted to continue for each property. Um, there are a couple permissions by development agreement, modest expansions, multi-unit up to 10 units per acre and ins. The issue of this restrictive zoning has come up before and has come up again as it relates to the resale and reuse of these buildings within the special commercial zone. Staff are proposing amendments to the municipal planning strategy and land use bylaw to include a compatible, a list of compatible commercial uses that could be considered by development agreement such as it was prior to 2014. Additionally, the list of special commercial uses would be examined to see if any of these commercial uses have been discontinued, and if so, staff would propose rezoning to the appropriate residential zone, as is the intention of the planning strategy. So, staff is recommending the council direct staff to begin the process to amend the municipal planning strategy and land use bylaw to provide greater flexibility in the special commercial zone and direct staff to rezone properties where the identified commercial use has been discontinued. Right. Thank you. Uh, questions from Councilor Thurman? Just a, a couple. That Lester Swicker trucking, I, I see a sign on that, Nick, and I see that it has sold. So what's the status of that now with this new change? So we will still we'll evaluate in more detail all the, the 15 or so special commercial properties in town. But uh, that commercial use, the trucking, um, well, truck parking, as it's listed, um, has been discontinued to my knowledge. Uh, it was sold. Lester passed away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a couple more on that list, but you've answered my question. Okay. Deputy Mayor. So just along those same lines, Nick, the, there's a commentary in the report about, uh, you know, some properties really don't switch back to residential easily because right. it's, a, it's a commercial building. So what do you do in those cases where it is a commercial building, the business has di been discontinued, is it a case of that building has to be demolished or like how does that work? And, and, that, and that's the main limitation uh, when it comes to resale of these properties. So if a building was purpose built commercial, yeah. it's more difficult obviously to renovate that to a single unit or two unit dwelling, which is what is permitted as of right in this zone. Um, so, so really that's, that's, the, that's the biggest issue. Um, and that is, is the rationale behind staff wanting to come forward with these amendments to, to provide a little bit more flexibility, albeit through the development agreement process for these purpose built commercial buildings to convert to another compatible commercial use. Okay. Um, but that, that is, it's, you know, I'd say maybe a third of them are, are fall into that category. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of these uses are in accessory structures, some are in homes. Um, but yeah, that, that's one of the main limiting factors with this zone. Okay. Further questions? Someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor McDonald. I move the town you. council for the town of Bridgewater direct staff to begin the process to amend the land use bylaw and municipal planning strategy to provide greater flexibility in permissions of the special commercial C8 zone. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Graves. Further discussion? Question. Question, Question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. There's a second motion there. Is there someone prepared to make that motion? Councilor McDonald, thank you. I would move the town council for the town of Bridgewater direct staff to begin the process to amend the land use bylaw to rezone C8 properties where the identified commercial use has been discontinued. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Graves. Any further discussion on that one? Question. Question. Question is being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Going down to reports and recommendations, application to purchase land, uh, Glen Allen, future Roundhouse Drive, and 
<laughs> Land will drive. <laughs> Don't go too far. Let's quick turn around. <laughs> okay, thank you. Staff have received an offer to purchase 7.3 acres in the Glen Allen area from Ziegler Homes Limited. More specifically, the area would become part of the Osprey Sound subdivision together with the Roundhouse Drive, the future Roundhouse Drive, and, and Landrill Drive streets and services. The offer is $80,000 plus, plus HST. Staff have determined that the offer is fair and reflective of market value. Um, therefore, staff recommend that the Town Council authorize execution of the purchase sale agreement and buyback agreement with Ziegler Homes Limited for purchase price of $80,000. Okay, are there questions on that? Yeah. It's, uh, just yeah. So there, there is a motion. I was. Oh. We have to authorize that. So there needs to be a motion. So just uh, give it a second, and we'll refresh our motion package. Okay. Thank you. Someone prepared to make that motion, Councilor Fragier? Yes, Your Worship. Thank you. I move that Council for the Town of Bridgewater authorize the execution of agreement purchase and sale and buyback agreement with Ziegler Homes Limited for the property PID number 606-51023 and with agreement generally in the form contained in document 20-140. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Thorburn. Not seeing anyone on the discussion? You look like you're, you're thinking. No, no, no. Nope. Well, You're good? No, it's a good <laughs> Question. <laughs> Save me from that one. Thank you. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Oh, I was there was I was gonna say something, but I'm gonna be nice to you, Councilor McGinnis, because only a few weeks left. Time is not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next item is RFP twenty uh, two thousand eighteen dash zero three public safety communications tower. So uh, we're not awarding this, um, but we have to conclude this, so it's it's quite straightforward. As I said, we are not awarding this uh, RFP. Is someone prepared to uh, to make this motion so we can conclude it? Deputy Mayor, I'm with the Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of the Engineering Department that RFP 2018-03 be concluded so a new revised RFP can be issued for the construction of the radio communications tower. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Vergeer. Any discussion? It's pretty straightforward. Question. Oh, that's How great. does it to get the uh, other two uh, communications companies, Bell, Telus, to use theirs? There's some issues, mm. as I understand from staff, of because we're in a valley, our communications equipment has to be in a very specific location, or we or we have pockets where they can't get the signal. Oh, so that's why. Yeah, and yeah. we did do some testing to confirm that. Okay. Yeah, I believe it seems like the logical choice, right? You got these large towers and. Yeah, so I believe it was at a uh, Public Service Commission meeting where we, we asked those yeah. questions. Why are we piggybacking on someone yeah. else's tower? What if the tower could go on the on public works? And there were some issues with the, with the valley. Right. But okay. good Great. question. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, any further questions? Questions. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried. Thank you. Our next item is uh, always a fun one, financial condition indicators. <laughs> this is your time to shine, Councilor McGinnis. Um, <laughs> I never know what to say about these because I don't want to insult the people who create these, but at the same time, there's a gap in what's really happening on the ground here in any municipality and how they come up with these. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking at you because I know you usually itch to talk about these. Well, no, I, I, it's really too bad because this could be a good report. But the, they're, they're not realistic in how they calculate. For instance, we're, we're penalized because there was a major snowstorm. Now, unfortunately, we had to clean that snow up. And that caused us to have a deficit. Sleep, and that caused us to be docked some points. Yeah. We had no control over that. So things like that, and, you know, we increased our debt and put money in reserves. Or we'd, we'd be in great shape. We'd get more good points. It's, it's not realistic. It's, it's not in the real world. Yeah. If you don't have a big enough surplus, you're dinged. If you have too big a surplus, you're dinged. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, there's a bit of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if anyone else has 
comments on that? Is there, I probably won't be here, but is there a possibility we can get someone down to address council so we can express our views to someone who has some influence on this particular item? Because it, it could be a very effective item for municipal units to go by. Yeah, and I think the problem is that you do have some municipalities that are not healthy in Nova Scotia. Yeah. And this report would be a way to seriously for the, for the people to see, see the seriousness of those um, stresses on those municipalities. The problem is it goes the other way and municipalities that are doing too well also get flagged and they look the same. Those two reports side by side look like unhealthy communities. Yeah. So Bridgewater, which is doing very well, would look the same as a, as a perhaps a municipality that is about to fall off a cliff. Um, so perhaps we should, uh, it would be municipal affairs, I would think, yeah, would come down. We have staff have and Don has I believe uh, Kim may have with uh, with our advisors as well just kind of indicated that the frustration with how the indicators are done the fact that you have a surplus you're penalized you, know, you got to come right in at a certain amount or um, you're penalized you got aging capital assets if you if you borrow to address that you're penalized like there's there's a there's a number of things that you can explain away and Kim's done that in her report to kind of explain why the indicators are the way they are we've expressed that to to the staff every time the report comes out just just our concern um, UNSM has as well yeah. expressed concern over the over the indicators it was meant as a tool for the province to, to see if there's municipalities in trouble you have to look behind the number you really do and, and they do acknowledge that, that, that you know, one size doesn't fit all in no. terms of how you, how you describe the financial health. It's just an indicator to say, hey, there might be an issue. Let's look at that. Right. <coughs> Councilor Thurburn. Well, yeah, when you read to that, it, it seems to be a lack of fairness the whole way around. I mean, uh, it's just not fair the way that you read that. I mean, there was one spot there, I think it was $20,000, and we got deemed for that. I mean, you got a budget of... 20 million, you know, 20,000 on yeah. expensable, controlled expense, I guess it was. So, so, yeah, should be more fairness. I'd like to see that meeting happen. Yeah. So, so should we, I know we've expressed our concern to NSFM and, and the department, should we express it directly to Minister Porter and perhaps invite him down to hear our dissatisfaction with the report? Sure. Love to have a chat with Minister Porter. We'll or, down. or at the Bridgewater. next the minister's tour. There you go. They, yeah. they go through the regions. Yeah. Yes. Um. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Just give me a minute to compose myself. <laughs> um, yes, for sure. I know uh, I had a discussion with uh, Mayor Mood from Yarmouth last year. Um, she's the president of the NSFM, and I remember we both gave almost the same interview with CBC who asked us the same question because Yarmouth was faced with the same. So their indicators made it look like they were in trouble for the same reasons, right? That yeah. snow from 2015, uh, it just makes it look like your budget was way off. How did you not prepare? But, you know, we all face that. But if you're a rural community, for example, I'm not picking on them, where the province clears your snow, that's not in your books. No. So towns all look bad. Rural municipalities look great. They don't have to worry about that excess of snowfall. So uh, going back to Councilor Thurman's uh, comment about fairness, there's no uh, separation in the indicators for urban and rural <coughs> if you offer these services or not, because we have to pay for things that happen unexpectedly. We have a pipe break downtown, costs a lot of money. Well, that's unexpected. If you have no infrastructure under the ground, you're never going to have to worry about it. That financial indicator is always going to be green every year. But things break. Councilor Thurman. Just, just one more question while we're on that topic. Like, we've put a reserve in now for, for snow removal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if we were to go over a budget again, we've already got that money in reserve. As long as we don't go over the reserve amount, then it shouldn't affect our indicator, Tammy. Is that correct? Um, yeah, you'd have to, you know, transfer that money from reserve. Right. But, but yeah, that was maybe just one factor in causing a deficit. So it's, right. it's essentially if you don't have a deficit. But yeah. planning for those types of events helps you to kind of weather those storms a bit yeah. better. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on that one? Okay, next one is RFP 2020-05, Job Evaluation Plan and Remuneration Review. I'll turn that over okay. to CAO. So council has included within the budget, I believe it is uh, 45,000 
for a remuneration review and implementation of that. So an RFP was issued. The RFP is uh, <coughs> soliciting interest from consultants who would do a job evaluation plan. So a job evaluation plan would basically establish uh, bands or classification systems and create a job evaluation tool that would help place positions within that classification system. The tool would be based not only on market but internal equity as well. So right now the present way of doing it is market. You have one position in isolation and you go out to market and look at what other places are paying that and you come up with a range based on an average. This would look at the internal value of that as well. So there's an organization, some positions have the weighting's different in terms of how they're valued. So the classification system would take that into to uh, factor and um, the tool would help management be able to um, look at placing positions long after the consultant's gone. So you don't need a consultant every time you, you have a position and you need to place them in that. Um, so they would look at, um, uh, do a market analysis to, as part of it, but the internal equity would be there as well. And then they would uh, work with the management team to place all the positions. So you would be training the management team to use this tool on a go forward basis. So again, we don't have to bring a consultant in every time we need to do it. And then there would be an implementation plan. So from the review, there may be positions that uh, would be red circled because they may be higher than the, the internal and external um, analysis. And there may be others that are below. So what's the implementation plan for those over, over time? And then that would be brought back <coughs> to council because obviously there would be an impact uh, budget wise for council's approval. So we had um, seven proponents uh, submit a proposal and uh, we had a uh, technical, which was basically their approach, how they would go about doing this, um, their experience, uh, resources, and any added value. And that ha had a value of 75%. So that was the weight on that uh, total and pricing was 25. So from that uh, evaluation, the proponent that's being recommended is uh, Gerald Walsh and Associates for a total price of $25,875, and that includes full HST, so we would just pay the net. But that's the, the they were asked to bid uh, full HST. <coughs> Questions on that? Councillor Graves? So when you go to the market, mm -hmm. do you go to public and private? They would go, yeah, yeah, they would. They would look at essentially Where's the competition? Um, where's um, com they look at comparable municipal units, but they would look at some private sector as well. Um, they would they wouldn't do every position. They would create benchmark positions, and they would take those benchmark positions and go out to other municipalities and organizations that would have similar type positions, and look at what their ranges were. Yep. Yeah. So recently there was a report, the Living Wage Report, mm -hmm. that was produced by the. Uh, the name of the organization. Anyway, would that yeah. play, would that, moving forward, would that, would that play into terms of salary for, for town employees? Um, it, it would be based on market. Uh, and, and so if there so were... You know the market's low for... Yeah, money. yeah. Um, I would think it, if the living wage was, say, higher than some of the positions, I think that's probably more of a, an organization decision about where you want to start off at. Uh, but uh, most of our positions that you would go out to market and if it were an administrative assistant you would look at what the market's paying because the objective is to be fair and reasonable with the wages that we set um, for a number of reasons but that that's the main thing and so the market if um, I can't I believe Bridgewater's was 18 16, 16 yeah an hour so um, we would, you know, that, that may be a factor in where you want to, you know, how low you want to go in terms of setting salaries, but. Okay, just want to get out there. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yep. I, I think the last time we did this, if I recall, there was a real struggle in comparing uh, job descriptions and roles within our organization to private sector. There just wasn't that relationship. But can you comment on that? Yeah. Has that gotten any more similar because of some changes we've made or um, maybe that's not there may, yeah there may be um, various positions like so if you look at a planner or an engineer there may, there be comparable um, to say consulting firms and, yeah, and those okay. types of things um, some positions you're right like building inspectors yeah, fire inspectors think that they're not necessarily in the private sector 
Uh, I would say that our market's probably going to be primarily public. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Someone prepared to make a motion? Councilor Fajir, thank you. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh, I'll make a motion that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of staff and award RFP 2020-05 Job Evaluation Plan Salary Review to Gerald Walsh, a Gerald Walsh Associates in, in Incorporated for the proposal price of $25,875 inclusive of HST. Thank you. Seconded by Second. Mayor Tanner. We've had a discussion. Question. All, question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, our next next item is just for information. It's the Limburg County Senior Safety Program uh, August 2020 report. And as always, I would encourage people to uh, take a look at that. Um, it's just continues to be eye-opening to see how much need is out there. And again, I'll just repeat like I do most months. Uh, I don't know what we would do without this program, pandemic or no pandemic, I don't know what we would do, but we, our community, our region would be in quite a bit of trouble without this during COVID. So that's there for your perusal. Uh, next item is uh, simply notice uh, for a proposed open smart community pilot policy. I don't know if there's a discussion prior yeah. to giving notice. No, uh, the intent is just to not give notice that at the next meeting we'll have that discussion and bring the staff in so can, council can debate that. Yeah, perfect. So I'll just say, just for the public's benefit, Ron, mm -hmm. but when we give notice of motion, it, we're not making a motion and approving it without debating it. This actually comes back. We're giving everyone a heads up that, that the next meeting or a future meeting we will discuss it at length. So it's just, um, I didn't want anyone to think we're just kind of sliding this through and <laughs> making motion with no discussion. Is someone prepared to make that motion? Councilor Thorburn, thank and you. I move that town council of the town of Bridgewater give notice pursuant to section 48 of the Municipal Government Act that the September 28, 2020 council meeting, the proposed open smart community pilot project will be considered to provide high level direction from town council for its smart city initiatives. Thank you. Seconded by? Councilor Fragier, very straightforward. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, our next item is, again, notice uh, revision to policy 89 fees for a new planning fee. And I would say maybe a simplification of the yes. planning fees is a better yeah. way to. Yeah, or, or and to incorporate a, a fee that we never really thought of, um, but we have a situation that warrants it. so. And again, that'll come back to uh, the September 28th council meeting where we will discuss right. it and get some information. So we're prepared to make that motion. Council McDonald, thank you. The town council for the town of Bridgewater give notice pursuant to section 48 of the Municipal Government Act that the September 28th, 2020 council meeting amendments to policy 89 fees will be considered to add a new fee for concurrent development agreement and municipal planning, planning strategy amendment and or land use bylaw amendment. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Fragier. Pretty straightforward again. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Next item, number 10.8, facade improvement program funding requests for 620-626 King Street. Um, I don't know if someone wants to just run us through this one really quick. Yep. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Brown. We should have stacked all these together for you. Just stand there for a good 20, 25 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> okay, staff have received uh, an application for, for facade improvement program funding in the amount of $5,000 from the owner of the property at 620, 624, and 626 King Street, Mr. Gary Ramey. The property is currently mixed commercial and residential with reliable computers and D and Company Hair Studio occupying the ground floor. The facade renovations will take place on the south facing wall, facing the parkade, but visible from King Street. Um, renovations will include window trim repair and other uh, cosmetic work to match the recently renovated front facade, that is that facade facing King Street, and that work was done last year. Additionally, the property owner is installing a steel framed <coughs> exterior staircase and balcony to the second floor uh, dwelling unit. The estimated cost of eligible improvements is $13,000 approximately. When the application was presented to the Downtown Plan Advisory Committee, that committee recommended that Council pr 
provide the requested $5,000 grant for facade improvements. Mm -hmm. Questions? Any questions about that? Would you like to have a motion? Yeah, I would, please. Thank you. I move the Town Council of Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of the Downtown Planning Advisory Committee, DPAC, approve a grant in response to an application su submission for 620 to 626 King Street in the amount of $5,000 upon successful project completion by the end of 2020 2021 uh, fiscal year. Seconded by. Councilor Brazier, any discussion? Only comment, uh, the, the front portion of that building has been massively improved and hoping this will improve it even more. Right. <clears throat> and this is an investment in our community and it's matching dollars, so it's all good. Let's hope another car doesn't hit it. <laughs> 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 all right, we have a mover and seconder. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Just a question oh, before sorry, yeah, no, I was, was going to ask before, but the property owners on King Street, uh, they can keep coming back year after year after year for, for grants for that uh, facade improvement. There's no number of times that you would give it. As long as they make a, a valid business case, then in only one case per year, then you could approve that. Is I that believe correct? that is correct, yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried, thank you. Our next item is grants to organization, and there's a uh, a few on that list. Mm -hmm. um, we have a grants committee. I don't know if they have any anything they wish to share about those. <laughs> it's a quiet group today. <laughs> Diana, can oh. you? I can for it. If you if you don't mind, that'd be great. Just so the public understands what we're about to do. So the Grants Organization Committee met approximately three weeks ago to chat about the applications that we brought in for the October, oh, the August 1st deadline. Um, we had five applications. We approved four. Um, and basically we're looking for council to endorse that recommendation. Uh, I can go over what they were if you'd like. Just just briefly for the for the public. So we've had a request from Social Field House Society for in the amount of twenty seven fifty. That is for a field cleaner or a turf cleaner. We've had another one from Social Field House Society for seven hundred for sorry, their grants are for more than that. Uh, that's what we gave them. Um, the first one was for $5,508 for the turf field cleaner. Uh, the second one was for $1410 for a request for supporting them to put on movies inside the facility. The next one was from Society of St. Vincent de Paul's Joseph Conference. Uh, it's an operating grant for $1,500. Um, they're looking for some help uh, for their support line, telephone line, and then the Bridgewater Clinic Club at $3,000. They're looking for assistance with some operating costs. Uh, and the last one we had was St. Joseph Roman Catholic Church looking for help with the wastewater upgrades at 2500 I'll tell you what we've approved. Um, we've approved Social Shore Field House for 2750 That's half of the cost of the field cleaner. Um, 780 to the Social Shore Field House for the movie night. Um, and again, there's detail in there about Fresh Air Films being part of that. Um, there's some in-kind that we're donating as well, but uh, Fresh Air Films is going to cover the cost of the licensing fee, and then we're going to donate the projector and the screen. 1500 to the Bridgewater Curling Club. Um, there was a fair bit of discussion around this, uh, providing this grant, um, and we felt that 1500 was fair out of the 3000 requested. Um, 1500 to the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Um, the committee thought that this was uh, fair as well, because um, it's a very important cause there and then zero to St. John's Roman Catholic Church um, the committee thought there was a conflict um, in providing that any money based on the fact that the town had or the Public Service Commission had requested that they do these upgrades to their property any questions Councillor Graves so have any of our municipal partners are they per, are they contributing some of the money so that house and, and the early club? yeah so that was one of the big questions that come up during our meeting we felt that providing half of the cost of the field cleaner was 
our co contribution and that they should go back to the municipality and seek some funds there because they hadn't. Um, and the same with, this, with the, um, the movies. Um, although we feel that uh, we do, since we offer fresh air films, we would offer the, our equipment and um, some in kinds of port, but um, we also feel that they, they wanted to charge admission to, for these movies and that wasn't something that we were willing to contribute to. And in regard to the curling club? Uh, um, does anybody want to answer the curling club question? Did, uh, as far as did we discuss well, about uh, um, uh, other municipalities? It was my understanding they were going to a municipality, yes. Yeah. It hadn't been confirmed at the time, I don't believe. No. And we don't know if, there's a, if they were successful. No idea. Okay, thanks. Um, just two things, Diana. Uh, in a previous meeting, long ago, I guess, we had requested that when these um, reports come up that we actually get to see the actual application. So if we could get back to that, that would be great because I think it might help answer some questions that we might have. Yeah. Um, but what is the $780 actually being used for? So in that application, they had asked or they, were, they wanted they wanted. To to cover field costs and that essentially what we decided is that we didn't want to support um, anybody paying for to see this movie so our contribution was towards the rental of the field itself okay, is that okay? was there an afternoon session and an evening yep. session yeah so, so there's two movies over that day three so okay. it, it staff members I think because six hours yeah. and then some staff in there so this is field time they all they mm -hmm. would have sold otherwise someone else charged they yeah. would have charged for people to come to these okay. movies so got it okay any other questions Cass Thurber I, I, this comes up numerous times and I'm in Andrews Court because this is a regional facility and the region should be paying for it and uh, I'd like to see all the members that use that facility put something back into it not just come to us first and then maybe go to MODL maybe not same thing with the curling club and I kind of agree with Councillor agrees a lot of the stuff that comes in less than 50 percent of the Bridgewater town residents are using it but we pay the lion's share of the bill and it doesn't seem to be fair and that has to stop you know we have to figure out a way to <clears throat> when it's something regional like the field house is a great example um, because if they go to MODL first they're going to say did you go to the town and when they come to the town we say did you go to MODL so we ha we kind of have to figure out a way to deal with things that are regional in nature at the same time. Yeah. Otherwise, you risk someone saying, I'm not doing it until they do it, and I'm not doing it until they do it. And then it either not, doesn't get done, or one municipality says, well, they covered it, so we don't have to. Yeah. And that has happened, and, and I'm sure it's happened the other way around, too. So it's different if it's something that's very town specific. I agree. But yeah. I, I think we need to figure out a path forward when it is. Well, something like this, we obviously both fund the field right. house. So maybe field house, LCLC, and a couple other things that are very much jointly funded, we should be considering in a, either in a different stream of grants or in a different mechanism. And I don't have the answer to that. But well, it mm. would, would appear to me all you have to do is make it conditional. If someone, if, if we're mm -hmm. going to give $1,500 to the curving club, say, Conditional that our partners, uh, other municipal partners, contribute to fifteen hundred dollars. Otherwise, we don't give. Yeah. Yeah. That's a harsh way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, because you can't really control the timing of their decision um, unless you both agree to make it, because um, you meet different times, different days. Um, yeah, it almost requires a joint committee for those regional. Mm -hmm. A joint recommendation to the councils, but the councils at the end of the day make the decisions, yeah. right? So uh, that the conditional might be the way to kind of ensure that it does happen. Mm -hmm. Council Thurman and then mm -hmm. Council Graves. I, I, I think we have to get together with our, our biggest partner, most of them is MODL. And the LCLC now seems to be working very smoothly mm -hmm. forward marks to them. But we should look at the other facilities around us and come to an agreement in principle on whether regional or owned by Bridgewater or MODL. And then by when it comes to funding, you'd have the ground rules already set, like the curling club, like the field house. You know? That that was something that was discussed at the mayor's, wardens and CAOs. Um, 
I, and a couple years ago, I do believe the rec directors at that time were tasked with, with bringing back what were considered to be regional facilities. Yeah. And they got, they got tangled up in the definition and needed some direction from the council. So trails, is it buildings, is it, is it museums, is it, uh, you know, like, so the definition could go beyond what one would consider a traditional recreation facility where sports played to cultural um, venues and cemeteries, like all kinds of things came up. And it kind of got stuck there, but if, if it is something that we feel needs to be, I hear it comes up all the time, you know, just, so if it's something that we feel needs to be uh, reevaluated, rediscussed, um, we could take it to the mayors and CAOs again to say we need to, to give it definition, because that's where it got lost last time, is, is no one was, couldn't come to an agreement on what that definition was, I believe. Um, but um, if we gave it definition and then direction mm -hmm. uh, to, to the directors uh, to bring it back to that group to kind of say, here's, here's the regional facilities and here's how we feel they, they should be funded. Uh, it just means that like there's facilities throughout the region, arenas in other towns and other municipalities, parks, all kinds of things that would come into play. And that's, that's where it gets complicated. Yeah, Councilor Graves. So perhaps in the interim, maybe staff can just work on these things. Um, they have a knowledge of the, of, the, uh, of the facility. So using the field house as an example, they know that we don't want to pay at all. We know, we know, they know that we're looking for fairness. And they can probably work with MODL and others, if, if, it, if it pertains to them, to come up with a package that is acceptable and then present that to the councils. You know, instead of us going back, back and forth, just say we decided on the number. That number is twelve hundred dollars or whatever that number is. These are the partners. These are the benefits, uh, and we're asking you to vote on that. You know what I mean? So let them make the deal. Is what I'm, is what I'm getting at. And then make the joint recommendation. Yeah. 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 I think that they are the other parties to that would have to agree to that type of process. So right. it could be something that was suggested to our partners that that they um, perhaps have staff determine what's regional and then look at how if there's requests for funding how that's dealt with on a regional level as opposed to an individual municipal unit level and then bring that back but I, I would suspect that we'll, if councils would have to agree that we're going to spend staff resources on that time so this council would have to agree that yes we want staff to do that and then we'll let you know how big of an undertaking that would be once we talk to our other partners. Because I do think it's going to get bigger than just looking at the LCLC and the field house. Because they have facilities that, that our residents use. But we have to make sure we don't overcomplicate it. Yeah. To me, it's, well, there's, there's yeah. like a handful of non-government owned facilities that are regional in nature. Field house is obvious. We don't own it, so it requires funding from time to time. It's used by people in town and out of town, arguably more out of town than in yep. town. Mm -hmm. So when they come for help, regional. LCLC, we already have an agreement, and we own it. So that one's that's easy. But to me, there's only a few. We're not really talking about parks. Those are owned by municipalities generally. We're not talking about cemeteries, even though they, they may or may not be owned by municipalities. We're talking about just a handful of recreation facilities. So you're talking hard buildings and uh, structures. Yeah. Uh, that's where we start. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Those are the ones that need things that can't wait, right? So uh, that's. Oh. So arenas and, 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 and so like Lunenburg has one, Chester has one, and, and ours. Um, those types of things. Like we could take that approach to our partners and say, here's what we believe the definition of regional recreation facility is. Do you agree, and can we talk about how we deal with requests that come forward? Yeah, just start with the hard asset first, and then yeah. we can expand. I think Councilor Fraser yeah. was first. I just wanted to say, yeah, it would be very beneficial to have a further discussion because, um, you know, uh, the grants um, four times uh, they have for the intake period, so we're back at council table deliberating these grants, and similar questions come up each time with with our. With our colleagues, um, so I feel that yeah, if we could get some further direction as to what's regional, maybe look at a draft funding model as to what's fair, um, sort of put that on the table as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
I was just going to say the other impetus behind that study that we literally almost went forward with and it was Ready? fully funded uh, by the province uh, was that so that when we say a group comes to us and says we really want an outdoor volleyball court, we had then have the data to define ah the outdoor volleyball court makes sense in this community or that area and here's how it should be funded and so on so that we're not all scrambling with 10 volleyball courts out there and I think it, it came up as a result of uh, uh, the splash pads as well I yeah. think that was the other area you know everybody wants a splash pad well where's the best area to put a splash pad and should we all just uh, share in the cost of that or should we have two or three scattered throughout the community so yeah. okay so we can deal with, we'll deal with this set of grants here but mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if we need to add this to the next mayor's I board. think we it, probably yeah. uh, we, sh we should make sure that they're they're in agreement that they want to look at this uh, and then we can give you kind of an idea how much resources it would take based on some of the input from them. So maybe the November yeah. one? Uh, there's there's one. one next week. I know there's one next week, but. Can you, oh, okay. I mean, we could, we could, I'm just looking like it, yeah, I know. one of the partners is changing because yeah. Mayor Bailey is not reoffering. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not sure she's going to want to make a commitment for her staff that three weeks later. Yeah. She can't make so, but we can we can add it, and she can ask to defer it. Maybe we do that. Let's add it, and then yeah, or we might be able to get a little bit of input from staff, and then bring it back to the November one as well. So we can just talk about it, do a little research, come back in November. Okay. I'm waiting for you to say again. <laughs> again, we were so close. Is someone prepared to make a motion for the item that's on the floor now? Councilor Brazier. Yes, I'll make a motion, Your Worship. That Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of the Grants to Organizations Committee and awards grant for the August 1st, 2020 intake period as follows. 2750 South Shore Field House, HB Studio Sports Center. $780 South Shore Field House Society, HB Studio Sports Center. $1,500 Bridgewater Curling Club and $1,500 to the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, St. Joseph Conference. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor McGinnis. Further discussion? Question. Question be called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Our next item is tender 20-06E, supply of decorative light poles and fixtures. And I see Mr. Davidson walking to the podium. Good evening, everyone. I don't get many opportunities to come here and do this, that's for it's sure. exciting, isn't it? I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, as part of the capital, uh, approved capital budget this year, uh, we are, the plan was to supply and install uh, 70 decorative lights. Uh, the first step is to acquire them um, through the tendering process, uh, which we did. Uh, we issued the tender uh, back in August, uh, or sorry, back in July, closing in, uh, in August, uh, with four bids received. Uh, the, the results of the bid is attached with the certifi uh, certificate tender certification. Uh, the four bids from Eddie Group Limited, uh, Rexel Atlantic, Graybar Can uh, Canada Limited, and Bird Stairs. And so, uh, the next step here is to, to get an award. Um, so the the plan, the scope of work is for 70 lights to purchase, uh, converting the old high pressure sodium uh, to a 45 watt LED. Um, staff will be installing the lights in-house. Um, the project budget was $300,000. Uh, we did receive $12,500 from the Beautification Street Program uh, from Municipal Affairs and Housing, as well as staff are investi investigating another potential other funding options um, through Efficiency Nova Scotia. Uh, the tender at this point, uh, reading the price here because I didn't memorize it. Uh, for the 70 lights, uh, supply and delivery is uh, $193,067.75, full HST, um, to be awarded to Graybar Canada Limited. Yeah. Um, just a couple of notes because Larry passed along a few pieces, a uh, few words here. Um, every poll will include a ban banner holder, uh, so I know that's an improvement on what we have now. Uh, and understanding that uh, the installation will be phased, so we're not going to do a whole section of King Street. We've got a few parks, uh, King Street, Shippers Landing, King Street Court, and Mariners Landing. Uh, so lights will still be on, so we might replace every second pole, <coughs> so to speak. Um, the I know there was a question earlier with respect to the um, 
or I guess through email, uh, looking at other options, uh, solar or whatnot. Uh, we did ask the supplier with respect to that. Uh, the price for those lights, uh, about four times uh, what we're getting on a unit price for the, these lights here. And um, we, uh, the banners, it should be noted uh, as well, um, the holders will be a different size than what we currently have now, so we'll be working with ourselves uh, to make sure our replacement banners will be sized appropriately and anybody else's banners. Uh, so uh, that will be a change, but hopefully we'll be able to accommodate that throughout the process. Um, does that mean that like the lights that we're getting with the different size banner holders, is that like a standard? Why are they different? Is it a new standard size? Not necessarily a standard, uh, new standard, other than this, these ones come with that size, uh, so it is going to be a change. Uh, we're hoping that we can get, uh, from my understanding, uh, some of the banners are all different sizes that we have right now, uh, so we're hoping to standardize to one, so over time when they're replaced, uh, then we'll have a one standard to work with. I don't know the size at this point. Okay. Right. Well, I do know the size at this point. No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, because I've been in the banner program for quite a while. And the confusion that we are having at the Legion is that uh, 22 poles now have a five-foot banner space. And the new ones put in are at four feet. I remember four feet, yes. Yeah. So what it means is that we have uh, usually between 25 and 27 people uh, supporting our banner program, but we can't put their banners up because the brackets are not there for us to put them up unless we can somehow alter them down to four feet. And, and it, it's pretty much uh, pretty difficult to take a five-foot banner that's in great shape that cost you $175 and destroy it and buy a new one that's going to cost you the same amount with less space for four feet. And that's a problem that we're having. So I wish you would or could or should keep the banner locations what they are instead of having two or three different sizes. Because the ones that use them, the non-for-profits, it's costing us a fortune. And I think we should be considered when you're making these decisions. Sounds like in this case, we don't have much of a, a choice. Councilor Graves. Yeah, so I think a big brother's big sister's got banners. Yeah. <coughs> they've yeah. got banners. A lot of money went into those. Yes. Uh, big brother's big sister's non-profit struggles yeah. daily to, uh, to keep the story going. It's a shame if there wasn't a way of accommodating them somehow. Um, it would be nice to see. So I do know the the with the expectation that by the time we receive those, it'll be November. So I think it's November 20th. Um, so we will not be able to install all 70 this year. Uh, so it's anticipated the first few that will be installed likely won't have banners on them. I don't believe every pole has banners because. We're, we're now going to a new standard where every poll will uh, have holders at least. So we won't be selecting those ones that have banners right now for replacement. So at least it shifts it off uh, uh, any impact for at least a year or two. Um, so it may be something that the, that the next council also has to discuss. You know, if, if these charitable organizations have spent thousands, yeah. for some of them, for these banners, and we, because of this, need to replace those banners, do we, do we absorb that cost? I mean, that, to me, that's a budget discussion because it's going to be an outlay of cost. But, you know, I would hate, to your point, Councillor Thorburn, they paid this money, and if we can't, if we get to a point where we can't hang them. Yeah. Um, I don't think they should have to use fundraising money to replace banners for no fault of their own. But again, that's probably a budget discussion. Okay. What's the uh, typical lifespan of these things? In terms of the light poles themselves? Or yeah. The, uh, the light poles? Uh, like how long have the other ones been around for? I'm like trying to see years? if the, there's no notes on that one, but you know, my time here, I haven't. I've, most of these poles are the original ones that I remember yeah, for okay. the last 20 years. So I would expect the lifespan to be longer uh, than probably the banner themselves. Okay, so maybe that's a bit of a saving grace. Councilor McDonald, would the would replacing banners be an eligible expense under grants to organizations? Could we direct them there if they need to replace some some of them? I. I don't know the criteria well enough know to know off the top of Wouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah, Should that be. might be a place where we could direct them mm -hmm. to, to help. Yeah, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Councilor Graves? So there's 70 lights being purchased. Are there, uh, is there backup? So are you going to use all 70 or? We will not, we won't be installing all 70 uh, at this year and, and purchasing the 70 is my understanding that there is sparse in place. 
and we've already used a couple of our spares already uh, down in King Street this year. Any other questions? Some prepared to make a motion? Deputy Mayor, please, thank you. I move that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of staff and award tender 20-06E, supply of decorative light poles and fixtures to the lowest tender, Gray Bar Canada Limited, for a total price of $193,067.75, including full HST, $175,080.55, including net HST. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Thorburn. We've had a good discussion. Yep. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <clears throat> Our next item is credit card fees for miscellaneous transactions. Um, so the recommendation here is to remove the administration, it's administrative fee um, for all on all fees other than property tax. And obviously during COVID, we're trying to, uh, although town hall is open, we're trying to reduce the number of interactions staff have um, for these small transactions where things kind of change hands. And so. Uh, some of the reluctance from the public is, well, they don't want to pay by credit card over the phone. Because of the fee. Because of the fee. Yeah. By removing that, it might reduce the number of people who, I'm going to say, unnecessarily have to come into town hall. And this would just be for this fiscal year, for the remaining fiscal year. And I believe uh, Kim has estimated that that would be roughly $1,000, 984, so roughly $1,000 to accommodate that. Are there any questions about that? Someone prepared to make a motion, please? Yep. I'll make Council a motion. Fugier, thank you. Yes. Uh, make a motion that Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve staff's recommendation to remove the 2.4% administrative fee on all fees other than property taxes for the remainder of the fiscal year up to March 31st, 2021. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Graves. Any discussion? Question. Question's being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Next item again is for information. It's the monthly build, building permits report for August 2020. And I would say all things considered in <laughs> this year, very, very bizarre year. Um, that's a pretty good report for our town. I know that uh, when I speak to real estate agents, they just, it would be the equivalent of, of items flying off the shelf. Yeah. They can't, uh, houses are being sold before signs are going on the lawn. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, I get emails constantly from people interested in moving to Bridgewater from large urban centers around the country. They do not want to go through the next wave or the wave after that <laughs> in their apartment in downtown Toronto, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver. They want a parcel of land in what is the safest place to be in North America, which is Atlantic Canada, and the best town in that land. <laughs> So that's there for your information. Next item is uh, RFP 2020-07, supply rotating biological contract <laughs> contactor assembly drive unit bearing, this stuff is really exciting stuff. That gets all the, all the really cool things to talk about. Decorative lights and, and wastewater items. <laughs> this is like the old days for me. Uh, <laughs> So yes, yeah, so the capital budget, uh, approved capital budget for 2021 included uh, two projects uh, should be considered together, which would be the wastewater treatment drive replacement, as well as the uh, shaft replacement for the rotate, rotating biological contactor or RBC in short. So this is part of a looks, it appears to be an ongoing maintenance uh, replacement program. Uh, we're on, I guess, unit five of eight, uh, or specifically unit three as specified in the report. Uh, the, we went out to tender, or sorry, we went out for RFP um, and we received two proposals um, for, uh, for the specified equipment. Uh, those were evaluated in typical fashion, covering uh, executive summary, qualifications, references, scope, approach, methodology, warranty, and price. They were evaluated and with the uh, firm with the highest score, um, which was Evoqua Water Technologies, uh, they came in and scored 86. Um, the, their price associated with that, or their monetary uh, side of things, is, it comes at an estimated cost of $331,440.67, including HST. Um, and that covers two mandatory items, which is the drive itself and the shaft, as well as a safety feature, which is the opt um, 
uh, optional motion detection uh, option. Um, so certainly I, I believe uh, that is important to include. Uh, we didn't, uh, we're not suggesting to the other two provisional items which were uh, related to a site visit uh, because of COVID issues, um, uh, as well as the extended warranty as well, which we didn't feel was needed. <coughs> Um, it's my understanding uh, that uh, we've, got, we've worked with these, uh, this company in the past and they did put some in the proposal clarifications and exceptions, uh, some additional uh, clauses. Uh, we accepted those in 2015 um, and, uh, and we've reviewed those with legal and the suggestion we can include them again. Um, that basically call it, cover some indemnity, uh, uh, termination and, uh, and, and delivery clauses uh, there. Um, so the options before us would be to award all mandatory options, including the provisional uh, option for safety, or just award the mandatory options uh, itself. Um, so we are recommending that uh, option one, uh, that we award to Vocal Water Technologies for an estimate of, estimated cost of $331,440.67, including HST. Uh, this includes the provisional item and accepting the additional clarifications and accepting exceptions conditions shown in section J of the proposal. <coughs> Questions on that? It's pretty technical, but it's <laughs> report is good. Is someone prepared to make it? Everyone should have one. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have eight, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you can have the old one. <laughs> have the old one. <laughs> someone prepared to make a motion. Do that. Thank you. I move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of the Engineering Department and award RFP 2020-07 Supply Rotating Biological Contactor Assembly Drive Unit and Bearings Wastewater Treatment Plant to Evoqua Water Technologies for an estimated cost of $331,440.67 HST included. $319,088.02 net HST, including the provisional item 5 for $9,650, and accepting the additional clarifications and exceptions conditions shown in Section J, section J of the Evoqua Water Technologies proposal and contained in document 20-160. Thank you. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Tanner. <laughs> Any further discussion? Question. Questions being called. All those in favor? Those opposed, motion is carried. Thank you. Our next item is RFP 2020-06, Town Hall Heat Pump Modifications Phase 2. The heat pumps that never go away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so again, in the 2021, uh, 2021 budget year, uh, we included the another phase of the uh, heating improvements, uh, specifically for the energized Bridgewater section on the third floor. Um, I don't need to go over the history on that one. Uh, we did issue, um, we did issue the RFP uh, in July and, and then extended it so that it closed in um, mid-August. Uh, we received or we issued nine packages and we three, received three submissions, uh, who are listed in there, which would be Seacoast HVAC, uh, Ainsworth, as and Wells Harry uh, Rhinos Refrigeration. Um, they were evaluated again with typical criteria uh, covering summary of qualifications, uh, schedule, approach, scope, warranty, um, and uh, the, there was a maximum score of 80 associated with a non-monetary score uh, and 20 for monetary. Uh, we came down to a tie uh, that is listed there. Um, so both Ainsworth and uh, Rhino refrigeration scored the same. Uh, with, uh, with Rhino, they actually had a better uh, technical or, or non-monetary bid, uh, but a higher price, uh, where Ainsworth uh, scored lower in their proposal, but had a lower price, or had a yeah, lower price. Um, so we did uh, seek some legal counsel, and considering that we weighted the non-monetary section of the RFP higher, uh, it's construed from that that that's the most important uh, and used as a tiebreaker. Um, so uh, we are making the recommendation, uh, staff has uh, to award to Rhino's refrigeration for the supply and installation of all required equipment and materials for the modification of the town hall heat pump system as proposed in the RFP dated August 12th for the total price of 
$504.50 plus uh, including HST and this recommendation would put us over budget uh, by $44,051.39. $4,400. Oh, what is it? I said $44,000. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So it's good to be good cash. I tried. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't have to go back to the finance <laughs> yeah. And I should clarify what I said was a heat pump that never goes away. The work that's been done since we started redoing the work has worked. Yes. So yeah. it's the original work that we're working on. Working on. Yeah. Are there any questions on this? I'm sure there'll be more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, someone's prepared to make a motion. I would Councilor Sorburn. I would move the town council for the town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of staff and award RFP twenty twenty oh six. Town Hall heat pump modifications phase two to Harry Reynolds Refrigeration Limited incorporated as proposed in the RFP dated August the 12th, 2020 for a total price of $43,504.50, including HST, $39,451.39 net HST. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Graves. Any discussion? All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next item, thank you, Mr. Davidson. <coughs> our next item is property tax financing borrowing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you are you running through that uh, or is there Kim's here. Our director of finance Kim has a strong desire to <laughs> don the mask. Yeah, <laughs> we got to get you in the routine of coming to all these meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I haven't had to be here very often, so yeah. so uh, this is my first one in person. Um, so basically, you know, the council had approved the property tax financing program for the interim tax bill. However, that allowed residents to apply for both interim and their final tax bill. However, we only had one approved um, application and amounting to $12,000. So the question is, you know, do we borrow for that $12,000? Or, you know, the opportunity is there with MFC to borrow for other um, cash flow issues that we're encountering that aren't re specifically related to the collection of tax revenue for, you know, for the, for the options that we provided. So some of our commercial properties did not qualify for the program, but also have not paid us. Um, and so the question is, do we borrow in addition to, you know, to get ourselves through? Um, normally, it would probably be fine, but the capital project listing that we have, you know, when you look back at our, our capital budget for this year and the next two years, you know, we're, we're using most of our, our temporary borrowing options for capital um, in the near future. And so while we're good for cash right now, by the end of this fiscal year, once the bills start coming in for this year's capital projects, as well as anything related to, you know, um, exit 12A, we're just concerned about what we'll have available. Um, it's a tough decision to make right now when it's we're not in that position, but the, the interest rate with MFC is 1.1% on this borrowing, um, which is really, really good. Um, so, and, you know, if, that, if those commercial properties happen to pay us and we don't need it anymore, um, we have the option at the interest date, which is every six months, or the principal date once a year, to put lump sum payments down on this borrowing as well. So we're not committed to it for 36 months. We could pay it off earlier if the funds become available. So it, it is quite flexible for the type of borrowing that it is. Um, and like I said, the next 36 months are, or 30 months, I think, with the MFC borrowing time frame, you know, we have a lot of capital commitments coming up. Are there questions? We have a <clears throat> there's a couple of motions that we have a couple yeah. of options. I guess how much are we considering borrowing for cash flow needs, I guess, is right. the question. So, so as for our receivables, because mm -hmm. that's what we're really looking at, at this point, well, as of the end of the interim tax bill, plus we add on that the what the commercial property final bills would be that, that haven't paid their interim bill, you know, we're short about $1.6 million um, compared to what we would have collected probably by the end of this month. So we're, it's a little tough to tell at the middle of September, but hopefully the rest of the residential um, payments come in well, like they did at the interim bill. So, you know, we're, we're asking a little bit early, but at the same time, MFC said, here's the pot of money, and when it's gone, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So if you want to apply after your interim bill, great. 
if you want to wait until later in the year, that's okay, but the pot could be gone. Um, so we are asking you a little before we know all the answers, mm -hmm. but, um, and the other point is we can borrow and before it actually goes through, we could reduce the amount if we need to. So the, any resolution passed this evening, we, you know, that's our maximum amount we could borrow when it comes down to, you know, dealing with once, because it still needs to be approved by Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing, they would need to approve our application before MFC would lend us the money. So between that time frame, we could decide that we don't need that much as well. This would be a maximum amount. Yes, can we, repay, can we repay that loan at any time? At the interest and the principal due date, so every six months. Every so six months. if we borrow in, say, October, then six months from October, we have interest due, so we could choose to pay a lump sum then, and then the following October when there would be a principal payment due, then we could pay it then as well. So every six months you have an opportunity to put a lump sum down in addition to the, the amount that would be required. Yep. And those commercial customers who have not paid and are struggling a bit, will there be a plan put in place for them to catch up? Um, both Tammy and I have ha um, met with them and have had correspondence by email subsequent to that. So there have been some small some payments, but not to lead us to believe that the balance will be paid off anytime soon. So this will get us through that period while those continue to come in and be a plan, a firmer plan that's put in place. Yes. And so the other thing to keep in mind that's probably not written here is that we charge 12% per year mm -hmm. on people that haven't paid their property taxes and we'd be boring at 1.1%. So keeping that in mind too, if we're boring for the cash flow, you know, we, we are going to be paying much less interest than, you know, that our taxpayers would be paying us. So we're still earning some income on that. Sorry, the account can't let it go. <laughs> so the recommendation, there's two in here. The first is that um, we just not, ex not extend the property tax mm -hmm. financing policy for the final tax bill because you haven't had any real uptake. There's no indication. However, um, the councillors themselves are the ones that are in touch more with the community. So if you've heard there's a need for that, we just wanted you to know that it was an option and that some municipal units are either had theirs open the whole time or are reconsidering it. So it is a consideration, but I think we had three applications. Two people withdrew within, you know, 24 hours to two days of their ap initial application. And even this, the, the one application we did approve, they only applied for their interim bill, not their final tax bill. And they were um, a business that was closed during the pandemic and is now open. So we think they just felt like they needed a little more time now that they're open. Please. Yes, please. I move the town council of the town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of staff and not extend the property tax financing policy for the final tax bills. Seconded by Councilor Frigier. Further discussion on that? Councilor McDonald? The, uh, the businesses that you spoke to, um, did they give any indication of where they are, what, what's, what their struggles are, if there's anything that the municipality can do to support them? Um, uh, not necessarily. They they might have indicated they were looking for some interest relief, but we weren't. We're not in a position to to do that. Um, and that was really the end. Just to have patience while they okay. they repay. Okay. Good. Thanks. They're having income issues on their own ends. Right. And I think it goes beyond Bridgewater. Yeah. If I. Yeah. I wanna, yeah. Any other questions? Question. Call all those in favor. Those opposed? Motion is carried. Would you like to make the second motion? Yes, yes. that move the town council to town of Bridgewater approve short term borrowings to fund other cash flow problems experienced as a result of receivables being collected slower than normal on larger commercial properties due to the current pandemic. Do you need an amount in there? Yes, you would need the resolution for $1.6 million $1. 6 or not to, whatever. Not to exceed $1.6 yes. million? Yeah. Okay. Seconded by Councillor Virginia was first. She's quick today. She was quick. <laughs> uh, any further discussion? Question. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, awesome. So you're just going to want to keep coming back. Uh, business arising on finished business. We have revisions policy 77 grants to organizations. So 
know, is a topic that keeps coming up. Uh, and Diane, Diane and Jessica. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Look like they were arguing about it. Look like they were arguing about yeah. it. So uh, at the last meeting, we gave notice about changes uh, to the grants organization's policy. And I have the wrong one open. Okay. So back in May, we had a discussion session where we reviewed the existing policy to discuss what is working well, what council's intention for the grants are, and what should be changed to reflect that intention. We had a really robust virtual discussion about that. I thought it actually went very well. Um, and, and as you've already been expressing tonight, there's some challenges um, with the current grants to organizations program that you wanted to see uh, changed. And so as we identified in the report, some of those desired changes were changes to the application intake to align with budget processes and other grant program horizons. You liked the idea of seed funding to help start initiatives or events. Uh, you talked about recognition. You talked about regional facilities and programs that should demonstrate regional support. Uh, the improved reporting on the use of the funds. Uh, staff autonomy to approve small grants and how um, staff are involved in the review and recommendation of applications to the committee. So attached to this report is the appendix that provides the revisions to the policy. And you'll see there's a lot of proposed revisions because we actually moved a lot of stuff around. It was a, a complete overhaul to how the policy itself flowed and where things moved. But the main uh, changes are that we now have three categories. We removed the, the in-kind category. So we have an operating, community events and community development. We have staff authorization. We're proposing staff authorization to approve requests up to $500, which is aligned with practice. And in the, the report, we sort of note that um, we're suggesting that uh, staff should also probably consider an in-kind policy to align all the different ways that we do um, provide some in-kind services for, for a variety of things and just to get some clarity around that. Um, it also, we removed that in-kind category because some of the grants under operating or, or event or uh, the community development could be an in-kind. So the example was the one here tonight where there's some in-kind being provided to HB Studios for the, the films through Fresh Air Films. Um, and that doesn't seem to really need a separate grant application to consider. Um, we're also suggesting to remove the four intake dates and bring it down to two. So we're suggesting a March 1st and a September 30th in an attempt to align to that, the budget cycle, grant application cycles, things like that. So with March 1st, it should align with, we'll get the grants in, budget will be debated and hopefully passed by the first meeting that we would bring uh, reviewed and a report of recommendation for the award of grants. So things can happen right away where, versus right now, um, grants are, the first intake is May 1st, and then it doesn't happen until sometime in June, so that should hopefully speed some things up. Um, and these, all of these changes are to take effect April 1st. Um, there is also, um, we'll be redoing the forms, and so we are, as some of the criteria, we're looking at regional support for certain things, so that is also included in the, in the revisions, not to the extent to which you've already been discussing this evening. Um, and I think those are all the major changes. So the other piece that um, staff will need to do outside of these policy changes uh, that you requested is for staff to look at those recurring grants and pull those out of this program and consider line items in the budget process. And so that's like senior wheels. For example, you also identified the Y and a couple of others. So we'll have some of that work that we'll have to still do, even if you pass the policy this evening. The change is it's to be effective April 1st, so we can provide notice to our community, we can communicate what the changes are, and work on revised forms and that sort of thing. So for the rest of this fiscal year, 
uh, grants would continue to come in under the old program. Questions? Councillors? I think we've asked for this for a while and it seems like it's starting to get what we want and thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. Someone prepared to make a motion? Councillor okay. Coburn. <laughs> I move that Council of the Town of Bridgewater approve the revised grants to organizations uh, program presented in document 20-051B uh, as policy 77 for the town effective immediately. Thank you. Seconded by? Should that Bridget? say effective April 1st? Or? Yeah. yeah. So effective. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So effective April 1st. April 1st. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Seconded by? Councilor Bridgewater, are you good to second? <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, any further discussion? Question. Question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. And thank you, staff, for that. Uh, down to new business. Uh, North Park and St. North Park and St. Phillips Park <laughs> fencing. North Phillip, St. Phillips Street Park fencing. Um, so this was something that uh, the deputy mayor brought forward after a discussion with a community member, and um, so that is there to move forward to yeah. budget deliberations. Uh, well, actually, it's here for direction from council as to how you wish to proceed with it. So presently, right now, there is uh, no fencing along the, the uh, St. Phillips North, North Park Street Park. Um, with the intersection work that's being done, there's some changes to the layout of the park. The basketball court is being shifted a bit, so it's moving actually closer to the residential property as you go down North Park. And uh, there's some concerns about um, balls and those types of things that could roll into neighboring properties, but also just about you know, young ones crossing the line and, and hanging out on private property as opposed to park property and kind of some of the, the impacts of that. So we've been asked to consider fencing and we thought initially maybe we could do that as part of the project because we are moving some components of, of the park around. Uh, transportation and probably fairly so has said that you know what you don't have fencing there now this isn't a new issue it's an existing issue and um, therefore not going to be considered to be part of the project but they did look at how they could um, uh, I guess alter the landscape of the basketball court to kind of keep it so that balls would would roll in instead of away from the court. So they are uh, considering some modifications to that. So that naturally they would, if I don't know, balls roll, they're gonna roll that way instead of to the neighboring property. Um, and so the, the issue of fencing is being brought here because it's been requested by the, a property owner to, to ask if there's anything that we would be prepared to do. I can advise that staff have advised me that there have been uh, some, some concerns raised over uh, over time about the fact that there is lack of fencing around that park and if we were to consider fencing we should do both the side but basically the, the sides that about private property so there's two sides that do the other two um, uh, but the street and I, I understand there is some fencing there already uh, so this would just look at the fencing along those lines at about private property um, mr. hood has advised that it'd be probably around 12,500 to do that it's not something that's included in our budget this year, and we have gone through a process of, of reducing our, our maintenance budgets, um, not knowing what the impact of COVID-19 would be. So we did take maintenance items out. Um, therefore, what's, uh, you, you do have the option, of course, to look at it as an as a unbudgeted <coughs> expenditure and deal with it now and direct that we, we put the fencing in now. We could refer it to the 2021 2021-22 budget deliberations and have staff included in the budget for consideration at that time or not consider the request at all. Questions or comments from Councillors? Councilor uh, a, a couple. Um, I drive by that park every day and would it be feasible at this time to fence in the whole park? That uh, roads are going to get quite busy there with the new interchange and turning radius there. Um, with the, the cost would be higher, obviously, yeah. than the 12000 uh, I mean, we, uh, could. We, we could, if you wish, put the part up that Andrew's requesting from the property owner now and do the other one in the next budget. That would be fine, too. But I think if we have an opportunity to make it safer for the kids and the people using that part, then we should. Yeah. That's, 
Uh, what's the timeline for the park being uh, finished? I assume it's probably prior to the snow flying. Um, they're working on that area right now. I don't know, yeah. Matt, if you know in anything about when the park, that, that intersection work be done in the park? Uh, well, specifically the basketball court. The so court? I, yeah. the, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Matt. <laughs> We have a large TV audience that wants to, <laughs> <laughs> wants to see this. Wants to see and hear you. Um, so I know they're working on a lot of intersections simultaneously. Uh, so I know my understanding that the, the, the St. Philip Street Park will be closed for a long time okay. to do the work. Uh, I know I go, I live down the road, so I go by that park quite a bit. So. The 12,500 is to enclose, so do the west side or east side and the north side because the TIR will replace the existing fence mm -hmm. that they've taken yeah. down. Uh, so I don't have an anticipated date okay. uh, for that, but I know so it will be for a while. So I guess Spring. my point of asking is we're going into winter season, mm -hmm. then we'll be into budget deliberations. I mean, we could Good do point. early approval yeah. or advance approval potentially for next budget season and or depending on who's around the table that could approve it for the next budget and get it done relatively quickly before the basketball court's even in place maybe. But mm -hmm. but I, I mean, I, I clearly appreciate this uh, homeowner or residence uh, concerns because uh, I've tried to play basketball and I know where that basketball can go when I shoot it. So <laughs> it's going to go through his window at some point. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, what I would just raise is normally when two neighbors, we're one neighbor, this person's another neighbor, when they put up a fence, there's, especially the person who wants the fence usually contributes to the cost of the fence. And so for me, I, I would want to know if, if some of the cost of the fence that is, is absolutely going to benefit this homeowner um, beyond the time of just when I get it, uh, the, when the kid's playing basketball, it's going to prevent the basketball from going on his property. But when there's no one there, there is also a benefit of having a fence that defines his property. So I, we're, we're, when you, in your discussions with the homeowner, was there any, any thought of any kind of contribution? <laughs> there's no, no discussion to that. Okay. Effect, no. Because for me, I would, I would be more open to, to supporting something if there was cost share. I just go back to my own experience. I wanted to, I wanted to fence my yard in, and uh, my neighbors were like, that's, that's great. But <laughs> you you wanted it, so why would we pay for it? And in this case, I know he's asking for it, but some of it is our issue. But I don't think it's 100% our responsibility to put up a fence for some somebody else. But that's just my opinion. So to me, I would support sending it to budget deliberations so that we can have that discussion and it gives staff the winter to potentially negotiate with the homeowner. But that's just my two cents I'm willing to entertain a motion to the contrary or whatever the will of council is or if there's any questions I for sure. feel comfortable deferring it at this time where the project is still ongoing and just to see where you know what the what the end result will be with the park and the and maybe get input from staff as to um, you know the safety of of the whole playground and and look at it <coughs> then and bring it back to bu budget deliberations um, back in the spring so and just if I elaborate on what I was saying too, is is perhaps we would go to the lowest bidder and put up a cheap fence. If you go to the homeowner and he might say, well, he or she might say, I'll contribute X if it gets a, a little bit of a nicer looking fence, which then does benefit the park, gives it a little bit of a nicer feel and does give me, the, for example, a privacy fence versus a chain link mm -hmm. fence. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna be an awful. Right? Yeah. So perhaps there's room there, but. Can I ask just one more question? Yeah. The existing fence that goes around St. Phillips and on to North uh, North Park, uh, that's staying <coughs> in place, is not it? With some mm -hmm. movement of it, I assume, because of the intersection change? Correct. That's yeah, it's not, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's no replacement of that fence, so to speak. No, okay. 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 Discussion, questions? Someone prepared to make a motion? I can make it if somebody don't want to. <laughs> Councilor Thurman, thank you. I would move that uh, Council for Town of Bridgewater refer the matter of fencing of the St. Phillips North Street, Park Street Park from a body and properties to the 2021-22 budget deliberations. Thank you. Seconded by Mayor Any further discussion? Questions? It's been called. All those in favor? Those opposed? 
motion is carried. Thank you. And that gives us some time to speak to the homeowner. Yeah. Next item is uh, FCM Board of Directors, Mayor Mitchell. Oh, yes. So I, <laughs> that was an interesting one. Um, so I was asked by a number of our municipal colleagues to let my name stand for the FCM Board of Directors. I want to make it clear that this is not for the table officers. So this isn't the vice president, president that, that has a large time commitment and that has a large cost component to it, which for me was off the table. Um, so this is uh, to be part of the regional caucus representing Nova Scotia. Um, right now, we are uh, overrepresented by our rural colleagues, which is fine. There should be rural representation, but there is a lack of town representation um, on that caucus. So I wanted to put my name forward to balance that out. And in order to even run for that position, you have to have a resolution of council. So that's why that's there. Someone's prepared to make that motion. <laughs> Push everyone. Thank you. This is going to be a tough vote, Andrew. Tough vote. <laughs> 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 this is more work for Someone me. Someone just threw me under a bus here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can vote against it and just save me a few. I <laughs> move that <laughs> Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater author authorize Mayor David Mitchell to stand for election as representative on FCM's Board of Directors, and if elected, authorize expenses related to attending meetings of FCM's Board of Directors. I have a seconder. Seconded by Councilor Fragier. Discussion? Question. Question. Question be called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Um, wow, we're already down at sundry items. Uh, <laughs> emergency health services application for flying the flag for Medic Monday. So I believe I mentioned at the top of the meeting that we had a proclamation for, uh, for this. And so there is a motion to fly the flag on the designated special purpose flagpole, which for those who don't know is at Shipper's Landing. It's where the Pride flag is proudly flown every year, and so uh, there was a motion there to fly that on Medic Monday, which is September 28th. If someone is prepared to make that motion, so it counts to grace. So just one day. I believe it's just the one, yeah. one day. Yeah. Yeah. Councilor Bridger. Yes. Make a motion. Yes, please. Uh, that Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve the application for flying the Emergency Health Services flag, as per Policy 81, flag flying on the designated special purpose flagpole located at Shipyards Land Landing on Medic Monday, September 28, 2020. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Graves. Further discussion? Question. Question be called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Can I add that item now? Mm -hmm. Do you know approve the agenda? You could ask for Council to add it. Yeah. Can I ask <laughs> Council's uh, uh, approval to add an item to the agenda? So as you know, there are um, med students coming from Dalhousie. Uh, at the end of this month, and they're going to be spending the better part of a year with us. Um, now, Lunenburg County, which um, worked very hard to bring these med students here, which is awesome, is planning to host a boat tour for them to kind of make them feel welcome. And I'll remind people that if they have a good time here, they're more likely to come back here. Um, but they're looking for uh, some costs to be covered on that. So they've been asking, they've asked each municipality to contribute $200 for this uh, event. I apologize for the late uh, late notice. They just arranged this, and, um, and Tina reached out just this weekend. So um, if council is open to it, I would be looking for a, uh, a motion to approve the expenditure of $200 uh, for now Lundenberg County for a boat tour for the uh, Dalhousie medical students. So moved. By second. Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Thorburn. So are these all the municipal units contributing to? They are going yeah. to, they're looking for, for $1,200. Yeah, okay. So they're going um, down to Queens as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah, because there are med students going to Queens Hospital. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Uh, we have a mover and Place. seconder. Any discussion? Question. Oh, question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Or all right. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Councillor Thorburn, seconded by Councillor Vergier. We are adjourned. Thank you. Beautiful.